and the train got stopped in Owen. Now, those of you who know me know that I have a cousin in every town in Wisconsin. And we had a cousin, an uncle, a whole bunch of other folks in Owen. So my grandma, Aveda Nichols, got off the train, walked down to a cousin's house, and birthed my dad in a farmhouse on the main street in Owen. But Owen didn't have a doctor. So they called the veterinarian. <laughs> my dad was born, he weighed 2.3 pounds. He was tiny. And in those days, 2.3 pounds, you weren't supposed to make it. They had to have an incubator, but Owen didn't have a doctor and didn't have a hospital. They didn't have an incubator. So the veterinarian and my great uncle and everybody, they thought, first of all, we'll put him in the oven and keep it at about 95. And then somebody said, well, that's just not a good idea. <laughs> so then they got a shoebox, and they pulled the light down, and they swaddled them up in, this woman's nodding, I know that trick. They swaddled them up in a little blanket in the shoebox, put the light in, kept him there, fed him for about a week, and he was big enough. They took him into Eau Claire. Doctor checked him out, said he's going to make it. My dad lived to be 85 years old because of the great care of the people in Owen, Wisconsin. So I will never, ever miss a chance to come to the North. So, folks, I, I, I don't want to bum anybody out, okay? I don't want to bring you down or make you think that we are not living in the best of times. But Donald Trump is president of the United States. That's, there's no good that comes of that. And Scott Walker is the governor of Wisconsin. And there is no good that comes of that. And so we are actually living at a point where our politics is so dysfunctional, so awful, so broken, that we have to start someplace to fix it. And I thought to myself, well, where do you fix the politics of Wisconsin and the United States? And it was pretty clear to me that if I was going to start someplace, I would start on a Saturday morning in a union hall someplace north of any city that the Democratic leadership in Washington or New York has ever heard of. And so I'm glad to be here in Wausau because the fact of the matter is, if we're going to win this country back, if we're going to win this state back, it starts right here with you people, with this grassroots movement. Do not wait for the Democratic cavalry to come. Do not wait for some candidate to come. You're going to do it, and it's going to be easier than you think because the fact of the matter is these crooks have exposed themselves. We know, we know what a lie their politics is. And we know that America wants something different. And this is a big deal. Because what have they told us for the last 20 years? What's their message to us for the last 20 years? And I'm sad to say, I'm sad to say, that includes Bill Clinton. It does. Bill Clinton gave us NAFTA. He gave us GATT. He gave us the WTO. He gave us China free trade. He deregulated the banks. He opened up Wall Street. Bill Clinton served as a moderate Republican, not as a Democrat. And the fact of the matter is, the Democratic Party was broken, broken by that era. When Bill Clinton came to the presidency, this isn't a pick on him, by the way. I've interviewed him. He's a nice enough guy, blah, blah, blah. But when he came to the presidency, Democrats had controlled one or both chambers of the Congress since the early 1950s. Since he's been president of the United States, since he was president of the United States, except for a marginal couple periods in there, the Republicans have had it. Something's been broken in the Democratic Party now for the better part of a quarter century. And you can't deny that if you want to fix it. You can't play around with that. But it isn't just, I'm not here to blame individuals. Not to blame Bill Clinton or Al Gore or anybody else. That's silly. That's the politics of pettiness. The fact of the matter is, what happened to the Democratic Party 
is that they bought into the biggest lie ever told. And that is that the wealthiest country in the world cannot feed every child, house every family, educate every teenager and young adult, create a health care system with Medicare for all, single payer guarantee that the wealthiest country in the world can only pay for wars, but it cannot pay for human uplift. That is a lie. And when Democrats go out there and say, well, we'll manage things a little better than the Republicans, then you are saying that you will manage decay and manage damage and manage less than what is needed, you aren't promising people anything at all. You're just promising them that you will give them an aspirin when they've got cancer. It's a ridiculous, failed politics. So, where do we get, now that's, that's easy to say, right? I, think, I, I, I haven't met anybody in the last year that hasn't said that. I'm not kidding. I mean, people really do get it all across this country. Some of them, some of them had the exact wrong reaction. They thought, oh, I'm so sick of these guys. I'll vote for some. I, I, I know the way out of this, this thicket. I'll vote for a billionaire. Billionaire populist. Little warning on this, always. A billionaire populist is always going to end up, when they have to choose between billionaireing and populisming, being a billionaire. They are always going to screw you over. That's a given. So Trump was never a good option. In fact, he's proven to be. I, this is an amazing thing because I always like this in politics, where you actually you, know, you learn things. Trump is worse than I thought. <laughs> yeah, he is like he is like more of a grifter than I thought. I knew he was going to go and you know basically rob us blind. And I knew he was going to put horrible criminals and, you know, like just the most awful ne'er-do-wells you ever met into every cabinet post possible, Betsy DeVos. And <laughs> I knew all that was going to happen. What I didn't know was that he's going to devote a substantial portion of the presidency to dividing us along issues of race and gender and sexuality and nation of origin and ethnicity. I mean, this guy, if he put half the energy that he has in division into uniting us, we'd be the most united country on the planet. We would be the United States of America. And then, what does he do in his spare time? He moves us closer and closer every single day to war. And this is, I, I am so sick and tired of politicians that don't talk about war and peace. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, war and peace is definitional. If we're not at war, we've got a chance to build something up. If we are at war, our energy is lost. It goes into building things in other countries, deconstructing things here. The fact of the matter is Dwight Eisenhower was right. If you have a military industrial complex, you cannot ultimately have the science, the education, the technology, and the resources to build your home. And that's what Donald Trump is doing. He is an incredibly destructive and dangerous president of the United States of America, and we should have no qualms about saying that he should be impeached and removed from office. That is not a debatable point. And I don't want, I don't want anybody to say, oh, what about Mike Pence? Mike Pence is the most boring, unpleasant person on the face of the planet. If he took over from Trump, it's not like America's going to fall in love with him. So the fact of the matter is, I don't mind if you want to impeach Trump and then impeach Pence as well. But what I'm telling you is Donald Trump's presidency should be done, period. That's a given. But the thing I hate most about these people, the thing I hate most about these people, and I don't hate people, I hate politics. Cover it for a living, it's fun. But, you know, it's a, the fact is I, I despise what our politics has become because it's all about a great big lie. And the thing I hate the most about the Trump lie, a lie that also many Democrats have fallen into, 
is this notion of austerity, this notion that we don't have enough to do what we need to do. So I'm going to devote my brief remarks today to my home state, the greatest state in the union, by the way. I don't care who the governor is. My governor's always going to be Ed Garvey. So it doesn't matter who the current governor is. My lieutenant governor is always going to be Barbara Lawton until she finally decides to run for governor. Then she can be my governor. But, but this is something important. My state of Wisconsin has suffered horribly over the last six years. My state of Wisconsin has seen its trade unions attacked and undermined and literally become the target of wealthy and powerful individuals who don't want them to be around because they are politically significant. And if you want to know, here's a little factoid for you. Three states that voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Three states that in 2008 had full trade union rights and in 2016 were right to work states that had attacked their public and private sector unions. You want to put the pieces together, understand they attacked our unions for political purposes. They didn't attack them to make workers more free, to make workplaces better, to attract business, to raise wages, to do anything at all for us. They attacked unions to win political elections because they knew if the working class was not organized, then the ruling class would have an easier time at the polls. And that is a shameful, anti-democratic, anti-humane political policy. It is a politics that is broken, and I devote my time to removing from office the people that impose that politics on my state of Wisconsin. <laughs> but let us, let us be clear, brothers and sisters, that they told us they did it because we had a budget shortfall. Oh no, a budget shortfall. That's what happens when I get to the gas station, pump my car full of gas, and then walk up and realize it was 22 and I only have 20. That's a budget shortfall. You know in Wisconsin when you have a budget shortfall? I promise you, I don't know this woman, but I promise you, if I was at the counter at the, at the gas station and I was a little short, she would give me a dollar, wouldn't you? And I would give you a dollar. Because a budget shortfall isn't supposed to wreck us, it's just we move a few dollars around. No, but Scott Walker used a budget shortfall to attack our unions, literally attack their ability to exist, to attack our public employees, cut a billion dollars out of public services, to attack public education, cut a billion dollars out of public education, to rewrite the rules so he could politicize every department in the state. Instead of giving, I would have given him a dollar if he didn't do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Koch brothers gave him $70 million, and so he did it. And they said, okay, you know, we got this budget shortfall. You remember what the shortfall was? Does anybody remember what it was? No, 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 no. Don't be silly. The budget shortfall, the budget shortfall, in 2011 that was the excuse for everything that they did to us that we couldn't cover. It was such a disaster. We had to change everything to cover the budget shortfall. It was under 300 million bucks. In fact, it was actually, depending on how you measure it, a couple of tinkers and twisters, it's around about maybe 100 million, 130 million. It was a small amount of money. Not small for me. I, you know, anything over 100 million, I'm, that's substantial. Um, I don't even carry that much with me anymore. But, but it was something that, as Fred Risser said, Fred Risser, the senior legislator, legislator not just in Wisconsin, but in America, said, we used to work those out on the back of envelopes. Like, you just say, oh, we got to move a little money here, we do a little of this, it's done. No, they used that. And why? Because they said we were so broke, so devastated, so without resources, that we couldn't do anything but. There was no alternative but to take our unions apart, take our schools apart, take our communities apart, to literally downsize our state. And they keep saying it, even now. Even now, governors say, well, I gave you a little more for public education. Did you see how much we've fallen as relates to the rest of the country in public education? 
He's not getting us back up to where we were. He throws a few bucks our way and says, well, I paid for your gas. He didn't pay for my gas. He didn't even give me the money I needed at the, at the counter at the store. He's putting a little more in there. He said, oh, I'm being a little more generous. He's not making us whole. He's not bringing us back. Why? Because he says, we have no money. We're so broke. We can't pay for anything. Anything at all except for his you know, private car and his security and everything like that. And then a corporation from Taiwan shows up. We don't have enough money to feed our kids. We don't have enough money for housing. We don't have enough money for health care. We don't have enough money for anything that we need. We don't have enough money to pay our workers. We don't have enough money to keep our farmers on the land. We don't have enough money to keep small businesses functional, to give them what they need. We don't have enough money to save our paper mills and our factories. We don't have enough money to do anything, but we suddenly found $3 billion to give to a corporation from Taiwan that has a history of failing every state that it tr promises to go to and that builds factories that are so awful that they have to put literally fences around them and literally like trampolines around for the people who jump out the window rather than continue working for them. A company that is so awful that even China says its environmental record is a disaster. And Scott Walker found $3 billion for Foxconn when he couldn't find the money to educate our children. That's a lie. The money was always there. It just wasn't there for us. It was there for a corporation in Taiwan. So as you look to 2018, oh, I don't mind if Foxconn comes. I think that's great. Everybody's welcome to be in Wisconsin. They, they want to give us a little bit, help us out, pay taxes, follow our environmental rules. I'm thrilled that Foxconn's here. That's fine as long as they follow our labor laws and other things as well. But I'm not gonna, I don't want to give them $3 billion. But I'm delighted that we have that extra $3 billion because I want to use that $3 billion I want to put a billion into our public schools. I want to put another billion into health care so that nobody is without the care that they need. And I want to take that last billion dollars and say to every struggling farmer, to every struggling small business owner, to everybody who runs a good factory with a lot of workers that's trying to get by, you don't have to close down. You don't have to sell the farm. You don't have to shutter your small business. You don't have to close that factory and lay people off because we've got a billion dollar revolving loan fund in this state to make sure that people stay on the farm, that small businesses thrive, that we can build up this state as never before. We've got the money, brothers and sisters. It's ready to be spent. Let's spend it on ourselves, not a corporation in Taiwan. It's owed to us. It's owed to us. Because this is the greatest state in the United States. And people from outside Wisconsin came here. They spent their money to change our politics. They spent their money to wreck our politics. That's why you're here this morning, because you want to build up a politics that's strong enough to see them off. And you have a duty to do that, a moral duty to do that. Because Wisconsin is not the state Wisconsin is not the state that follows the rest of the country. It's not the state that meets the average. This is the state that has always led the United States of America. When we rallied against Scott Walker in 2011, we rallied by the statue of Colonel Hans Christian Haig, a Norwegian immigrant, Art, a Norwegian immigrant who in his 30s became the head of the prison system in the new state of Wisconsin. And when a fugitive slave came to Wisconsin, Hans Christian Haig would say, I'm sorry, we've apprehended this young man or this young woman. The slave catchers can't take him or her back to the South. 
We are delegating members of our staff to take this young man or this young woman on to Canada where they will be free of slavery. He used his public position to fight the sin of slavery. When the Civil War began, Hans Christian Haig organized a Norwegian-speaking unit. Where's our guy with his, look at his t-shirt here, stand up. Make America Norsk again. He organized a Norwegian-speaking unit where they would take the orders in Norwegian because if they were in the front lines taking on the slavers, taking on the Confederates, he didn't want any English language order to come down telling them to withdraw because the Norwegians would say, fight on, fight on until we end slavery in this country. That's who we rallied by. And brothers and sisters, in that civil war, in that civil war, kids came from Marathon County and Portage County. They came from across this state, Lincoln County, Sawyer County. One after another, they came, they signed up to volunteer to fight in that war. It was a horrible war. And now the historians lie to us. They tell us it's okay. Oh, Confederate flag, that's just a symbol. That's just a, that's heritage. That's not heritage, that's what we fought against. And the fact of the matter is our people went down to those front lines in the South. We had a governor of Wisconsin die in the mid-1860s because he was down there caring for Wisconsin soldiers who'd been harmed and beaten in battle. Our state was so committed to that war that when we put the Wisconsin 24th down at the bottom of Missionary Ridge, looking up at those Confederate batteries on that line between the North and the Deep South, between the mid, between the mid part of the country, the, the, the border states in the Deep South where the slavery was at its worst. Down at Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge, our Wisconsin 24th, they were down in the trees, down over to the edge there. The elite units from New York and Pennsylvania, they tried to take Lookout Mountain that day because that was where they broke the line and entered in, brought Union forces into the South for the purposes of saying, finally, the slave power will be defeated. And those, those elite units didn't make it up Lookout Hill that day, they, they fell back, they withdrew. And there's a group of Wisconsinites, kids from Sawyer County, and kids from Lincoln County, and kids, kids from Marathon County, and places across the state. They were down there at the bottom of the hill in that woods. They were underarmed and they were undertrained. But they took a vote among themselves and they decided, no, today I think we're going to end slavery. Today I think we're going to take it on, head on. And so they decided to try and take Missionary Ridge, one of the highest embankments there between the border states in the south. Confederate weapons all across the top of it. One kid came running out with the flag. Confederate cannon beheaded him. Another kid came over that, that berm and came running up. He was mowed down by Confederate bullets. The flag was there on the ground. 20-year-old kid from Milwaukee, Arthur MacArthur, came over the berm there and grabbed the flag, the Wisconsin flag, and started running up that hill. He got hit in the arm. He got hit in the leg, but he kept on running up that hill. And amazingly enough, he made it to the middle of the cannons at the top and stood among the Confederates who were shocked to see a Union soldier standing among him. And he took that Wisconsin flag and he yelled, on Wisconsin, on Wisconsin. And those kids from Sawyer County and from Marathon County and from Russ County and from Iowa County, where my family's from, they came pouring over that berm and many of them died but they kept running up that hill. Many more fell, but they made it to the top. And there, when they took Missionary Ridge and broke the line, broke the line not of the Southern resistance, but broke the line of slavery itself. And then when they poured over that line into the state of Georgia and began what would become the eventual push to win the Civil War, when those Wisconsinites did it, they said we did it because the rest of the country wasn't quite ready to take the harm, to take the risks, to do what was necessary to end the original sin of the American experiment. For the last six years, this state has taken a lot of hits. We've had a horrible governor and a horrible legislature. They've done some pretty awful stuff to us. 
but it's not as bad as going up Missionary Ridge. It's not as hard as taking on the slave power. Brothers and sisters, what I come to tell you is, that's who we are. That's our stock. That's our blood. My, my father weighed 2.3 pounds and lived 85 years. The fact of the matter is we are stronger than the rest of them. We went off course early. The rest of the country has gone off course since. I like to believe we gather in Wausau on this Saturday morning to commit ourselves to take this mountain once more, to get to the top of that hill, to vote this governor out, to vote this legislature out, to vote in a governor and a legislature who stand for economic and social justice, to reelect a senator who stands for peace in this country and around the world, to change our politics here, to change our politics nationally, so that we can say, when we stand on top of that hill and we wave our flag on Wisconsin, and Wisconsinites will come, but people across this country will realize that day that Scott Walker gets voted out is the day that we begin to take our country back wholly and forever. We can do this, brothers and sisters. In fact, in the name of those who fought at Missionary Ridge, in the name of Robert M. LaFollette, who gave us our progressive movement, in the name of Gaylord Nelson, who gave us our environmental movement, in the name of Ed Garvey, who renewed populism in this state, in the name of Dave Obey, who served a damn good time in our U.S. Congress fighting for working class people. In the name of all that has come before, brothers and sisters, in the name of social and economic justice and racial justice and peace, I say we begin today. We take the mountain. We yell on Wisconsin. We lead our state and this nation to the higher ground. Solidarity. John. Thank you, John, for taking the long way.